Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. I hope that the Lord is blessing you, even during this time of difficulty that we are all facing. We have been for the last, I don't know, six months or maybe a little less, been asking the question from the Gospels, is it true? And we've gotten to the end of that, and today and next week we'll be finishing up by asking, how should that affect the way that we live? If the resurrection is true, and we have proclaimed that it is, and we last week at Easter celebrated the resurrection, if the resurrection is true, then how should it affect the way that we live? How should it affect the, the, the way that we go through our lives? And one of the interesting things that Paul says in the famous resurrection chapter, and you remember we've spent a good bit of time looking at this chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, and in 1 Corinthians 15 and 32, Paul says something very interesting about our own ethical obligations. He says to us, If the dead be not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. It seems as if there in that verse 32, that Paul is saying, what is our point? Uh, what is the point of our even living if, if, we, if the dead are not raised from the, from, the, from the resurrection? And it, it ought to cause us to stop and think a little bit. Because there in that very same verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about he has fought with the wild beasts at Ephesus. I don't think he means by that that he's fought with some sort of uh, monster or beast. I think he probably means the riot that we are told about that happened there at Ephesus. But he says to us, what good is it if the dead are not raised? If there is no resurrection, Paul seems to say to us virtually, he seems to say to us, if there is no resurrection, then there is no basis for our ethics. I remember once I, I saw a very famous ethicist, a uh, skeptic really, not an ethicist, who uh, also uh, happened to be uh, in a place where I was, and I was talking to him for a while, and then I said to him, why is it that you are moral? And he said, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And I said, what, what basis, given the fact that you're an atheist, you don't believe in God, what basis do you have for being moral? And he said, that's the most unkind question that anybody has ever asked me. And I, I've said, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, give you any problem. I'm just asking you a, a specific question that without the morality handed down by someone superior to us, what basis does your mor morality have? And he said, I'm moral because it pleases me. If I want to give someone money, I do so because it pleases me. And I said, well, there are other people that it pleases them to commit murder and to torture and kill innocent people. And he said, I, I just don't want to talk about this. I don't think it's the place or the time. And it, it seemed to me that that sort of cut at the edge of what was going on there. And that was, what basis do we have for the moral acts that we engage in? One, how do we know that they're moral? And two, how do we know that if they are moral, that we ought to engage in them? That is, why shouldn't we just do exactly whatever we want to? And that seems to be what Paul was saying there in that 32nd verse of 1 Corinthians. He's saying to us, if there is no resurrection, then all of us ought to just do whatever we want because there's no basis for morality. And so I wanted for us in these last two classes about this particular topic to think about this idea of morality and why we should 
have it and what exactly it can, can what, where it comes from and what we should do. And Paul seems to say very clearly here in 1 Corinthians 15 that the resurrection ought to affect our ethics. It ought to affect the way that we treat other people. And if you'll notice, one of the interesting things about 1 Corinthians 15 is that there are 58 verses in that chapter. And it begins, the chapter begins with this sort of uh, Paul saying that we all ought to remember the reason that we are here and the reason that we have come together. And then after those first two verses in which he says that, he says to us that we ought to pay special attention to the creed that has been given to him. So he begins in verse 1 and 2 with essentially the gospel, the gospel that I preach to you, he says. Then after that, he moves on in verses 3 through 7 to say this creed that someone had given to him, he says, that which has been delivered to me, I also received and I delivered it to you. And so he's telling us about that creed. Then he tells us about the resurrection having been seen by the apostles. He tells us about how the resurrection works out in each of our lives. And there are 58 verses in this wonderful chapter all about the resurrection. But we ought to learn, one of the things that I spend a lot of time teaching my students is that the verses are often in the New Testament problematically divided. And that goes not just for the verses, but also for the chapter. You know that when Paul originally wrote this book of 1 Corinthians, and when he got to this part about the resurrection, he didn't say, this is chapter 15. When Paul was writing this letter, this was just one long letter written to be read to the church at Corinth. That city still exists there today. But what we don't have today is the original version of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We don't have Paul's own writing. And so what we have are copies, and we've talked about how we know that those are accurate much earlier in this class. But now what I want to do is remind you that they were not divided into chapters and verses until later. And that makes a difference, I think. It makes a difference because of the fact that Paul moves on from the end of chapter 15 into chapter 16 with some specific ethic. Now, in the end of chapter 15, verse 58, he says, therefore. Now, you know that whenever you see a therefore in the text, that a conclusion is coming. So he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We'll talk about that, what it means to be steadfast and immovable next week. But for today, I want us to think about what, what comes after that. After Paul has spent all this time talking about the resurrection and what's going on, what does he come to? And the first verse in chapter 16, I think, it, it's, I think there's an unfortunate division between chapter 15 and 16, because Paul says, now concerning the contribution for the saints, Paul is saying to us that one of the things that we ought to be, be very, very aware of is that the resurrection ought to affect the way that we deal with and the way that we treat other people. And there, specifically, Paul is saying here, it ought to affect the way that we treat those among us who are poor. This is an, an interesting thing for us to think about, particularly in light of the, the issues and problems that we face today, all of us being you know, sort of huddled away in our houses. Many of us are, are still doing well. We are working, working for companies where we still have a job and we can be very thankful to the Lord for that. But there are others 
think about that single mother who might have been a waitress and, and now her restaurant has closed down and she's trying to figure out how to make her payments. Think about the fact that one of the things that the, the, the Lord and Paul both are very clear to us about is that we ought to be very, very specific in giving some of our money away and that the church is one of the ways that we use to help take care of the poor. You remember that when, when there was this question, in, in, it, 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 the question works itself out in Galatians and in Acts 15. There's this question about whether or not a person needed to become Jewish before they became Christian. And, of course, in Galatians, Paul says, no, you do not need to hold to the Jewish boundary markers like circumcision and food laws in order to become a Christian. And in Acts chapter 15, they have this big meeting of the, the pillars of the church, the church. They have James, the brother of the Lord, and they have Peter there. And it, they go there and Paul says to them, this is what I'm preaching, this is the gospel. And they say, yes, that, that is. And then they say, don't neglect the poor. Take care of the poor. And that sort of re reinforces Jesus when, when he is asked, what is the greatest commandment? There was during this time in Second Temple Judaism, this, I don't want to call it a contest, but it was sort of a cultural uh, question of, can you recite the greatest commandments of God while standing on one foot or something like that. And so Jesus, when he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says, well, there, there are two great commandments. You want to love God and you want to love your neighbor as yourself. So the number two commandment that Jesus <clears throat> gives out is that we who are followers of Christ ought to do all that we can because of the resurrection. We ought to do all that we can to help those who are around us. And so one of the things that we might ask is, well, how do we know whether or not we, we ought to help somebody? Or where should we start in helping a person? And Paul goes into that in Galatians. In the sixth chapter of Galatians, and in the 10th verse, Paul says, let us do good to all. That is, we, we want to give to all, but we want to give especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so it's almost as if there are these, these rings that, that go outward. The first per people that we want to make sure are taken care of are those who are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It might be the widows and the orphans who had almost no help and no hope in Second Temple Judaism. Paul wants to make sure that the church does what a synagogue would have done, and that is try to help those people who cannot help themselves. And the question, of course, is here in 1 Corinthians 16.1, Paul says, now I want to talk to you about this collection for the saints. There are some poor people, Paul is saying, and they desperately need your help. And I've just finished telling you how the resurrection changes our lives. One of the ways that it changes our lives is that it changes the way that we spend our money and the way that we give our money. And so he asks them here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he asks them, give some money. He's not embarrassed about it. He's not afraid of it. He recognizes that this is very, very significant. And then, interestingly, in the second letter to the Corinthians, he talks to them about this offering again and about how they have given and he says to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says to them, you gave more 
than I had hoped. And he says in 2 Corinthians 8, We want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God which has been shown in the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, there, there had been some kind of a famine that they were very worried about. In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. For they gave according to the means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. They had given those who really didn't have much, Paul was saying, had given so much more than he had ever, ever held. And we see this in a variety of ways. For example, when, when someone comes to Paul, to Jesus, to be saved or to be healed, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, what, how much money do you have? And how can you help me? And what can you do for me? Those are n none of those are the things that Jesus says. He doesn't say any of that. He often simply gives them help. You remember in the Synoptic Gospels, the woman who had a severe problem, and she all that she wanted to do was touch the cloak of Jesus. And she then, in a big crowd around him, touches just the hem of his garment. And he stops and says, who touched me? And all the disciples are around him and they say, Lord, there's a gigantic crowd here. What, what do you mean, who touched you? And Jesus then saw the woman. And the text says in Matthew, she went away that day. And the text said, she went away that day saved. Now, the word for saved in the Greek text can sometimes simply mean healed. It may be that she just went away healed, and that's what Matthew means us to understand. But I, I don't think so. I think what Matthew wants us to understand is that that woman's faith, despite her poverty, because she had spent all that she had trying to get rid of the disease, despite her poverty, Jesus gives to her not only physical healing from the disease, but he gives to her spiritual healing. He gives to her, in actuality, salvation. And Jesus is that kind of person. He gives to those who so, so often desperately need it. And so now I want us to think a little bit about some implications of this question of our own, our own uh, ethic. And that is, does, does our ethic affect the way that we will be treated in heaven? It's an interesting question. Essentially, what I'm asking for you to think about is this. Will those who work harder for God on earth or who give more of themselves on earth, will they be greater, will they see greater rewards in heaven? And for example, in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, the, the, Paul is saying, each will receive his own reward according to his labor. And you can see that if, as you're looking at 1 Corinthians, remember that there's this question of, some of them have been saying that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and Paul uh, tries to correct them on that and say, I didn't baptize any of, you, any of you save Crispus and Gaius. And then he says to us, in verse 8, he says, He who plants and he who waters are equal. That is, he, he has said about Apollos and others, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. He says... Uh, he who plants and he who waters are equal, and each shall receive his wages according to the labor, or his own reward, depending upon which translation you're reading, according to his, lab 
And so, does that mean, then, that there will be in heaven some with greater rewards and some with lesser rewards? That is, some who make it into heaven, but they don't have much else besides there. And an interesting passage comes in, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians after he says he each will receive his reward. In verse 15, he says to them, If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But, he says, he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And some uh, less literal translations will say something like, he will be saved, but only by the skin of his teeth. And so, does that mean then that some people will be saved and get great rewards in heaven, and other people will not get great rewards in heaven because they haven't given of themselves, they haven't given of their time? And so, on one side, and I want you to understand this is a it's a complex question and it has a variety of answers depending upon who you who ask, whom you ask. But there are some who will say that what you do with Christ before salvation is all God's grace. That is, none of us gets into heaven because of what our own goodness. That, that doesn't happen. But, they will say, what you do with Christ after salvation determines the capacity to which you will enjoy salvation. What they are saying is, quite pretty literally, that the better Christian you are here on earth, the more your rewards will be when you get to heaven. And some might say, but wait, wait a minute. Remember that it, when, when Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he says to the Ephesians in the second chapter, a passage that all of us are familiar with, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. And so they might say very clearly there, Paul is saying that it's not because of works, no one can boast. But one of the things that I always teach my students is when they're thinking through a passage of Scripture or a difficult doctrine, make sure to read the context. And so, not just Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but if we look at verse 10, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, on the one hand, there are those who will say that you indeed do get greater rewards in heaven depending upon how, what you've done with your life for Christ here on earth. There are others who will say, no, that's not the case, and that we shouldn't be somehow thinking that we are, are going to get something better because we give something better. Uh, so there are a variety of answers to this question. And what does it mean, for example, what sort of uh, activities seem to be rewarded if you believe that one's rewards are greater in heaven depending upon what one does? What kind of activities seem to be rewarded? Well, one would be evangelism, because you remember from 1 Corinthians 15 again, we come back to the resurrection chapter. We remember that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul very clearly says in the first two verses that one must first know Jesus Christ and the power of His resurrection. So that's one of the things that might be uh, rewarded. A second is help for the poor. Think about some of the things that Jesus says. For example, He says in Luke uh, 14, He says the, the, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. 
Jesus, in essence, was a homeless man. Now, he was taken care of by those who were around him, but he had very little in terms of the ownership of property. I heard uh, a few months ago of a particular uh, minister of the gospel who was, through a variety of unethical kinds of means, making over $8 million a year. This was a person in another, uh, in, in another state, uh, outside of even the South here. And I, I thought about that. What, A, I, what could you do with $8 million a year? What, I mean, at some point, you've, you've got enough. And second, we, we worship a homeless man. We worship a simple man who, who could have had everything, and yet he gave all of that up. And so it's clear that helping the poor is Christ-like, that, that, that Jesus denies himself. Uh, one of the really interesting things that I, I came to find out in studying for this, this lesson was that uh, the Reformation can be said to have sort of started welfare. Now, that's a o- way oversimplification. But essentially what happened was that at the the Reformation, Luther began to realize that there were Christians who had nothing and who were having to beg because they were, perhaps they were children, perhaps they were uneducated, perhaps they were widows, whatever it may have been. And so uh, Luther decided to have this, this, essentially this pot of money from which people can get if they are desperately poor and need it. He wanted to put a 5% cap on interest, Luther did, that nowhere in Germany could anyone charge more than 5% interest. Now, it's a very interesting sort of theory that Luther had. And so someone said to him one time, he said, you know that when you give out money like that to people, there are going to be people who are going to take advantage of you. Anyone who has worked for the church or been around the church very much can't deny that there are those who come to the church simply because they want to get money and and take advantage of, of whatever the church can give them. And Luther said this, He who has nothing to live shall be aided. If he deceives us, and has more than he says, what then? He shall be aided again. Luther is saying it's our job to try to help the poor. If if the poor trick us and they're not really poor, well, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to try to do as much as we possibly can to help those around us who don't have enough, first to help our Christian brothers and sisters, and then to widen out as we can. And there are a couple of different ways that this can work itself out. I think you'll see these. One way that it can, and both of these can be sort of subsumed under the, the, the heading of simple living. And I'm not saying by this that that somebody ought to give away everything they have, and if they have any kind of nice things at all, that there's some kind of a sin. I'm not saying that, because Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he says, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. So if we're going to live simply, how does that work itself out? I think one of two ways. One of the ways is, that we can make as much money as we possibly can and then live simply and give what we have left to the Lord and to the Lord's work. And there are people who make lots and lots of money and they give 
lots and lots of money to the work of the Lord so that the poor and others might be helped. That's one way that we could do this. Another way is to make enough to live simply and then give our time to the Lord. So if the Lord calls us into ministry, for example, we ought not to be worried about how much we're going to make. We ought not to be worried about the the millions of dollars that we might take in. We ought to be willing to live simply, to do all that we can for the church in the time that we can. And so we see that resurrection is not just a, 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 an argument for Christianity, although it is that, and that's significant and important. Resurrection is a great argument for the truth of Christianity. The greatest argument, I would say. But it's also an impetus for right living. It's an impetus for our own ethic. And that's a very significant thing. And so in order to, to leave you thinking about this question of what happens in these rewards that one gets in heaven? And there, there do seem to be talk about rewards in heaven, and there seems to be talk about crowns. There's talk about crowns in 1 Corinthians 9. There's talk about crowns in James 1.12 and in 1 Thessalonians 2. So it may be that those who do more for the Lord get, more crowns. But one of the things that I think is critically important for us to, to realize is that those crowns do not make an, an imprint upon the, the head of the person who is wearing them. It's not that the person who has the biggest crown is walking around for everyone to see. In Revelation 4, in chapter 10, it says the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, Worthy art thou, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things, and by thy will they existed and were created. So, regardless of where one falls on this rewards or lack of rewards in heaven, what's more important is the realization that those rewards ultimately belong to the one who was resurrected. The one who did indeed die and rise again for us. And so let all of us end today thinking about this idea that the resurrection doesn't just help us theologically, although it does. It doesn't just help us apologetically, although it does. It also helps us ethically because it shows us the way that we ought to live. It shows us the way that we ought to treat other people. It shows us the way that we ought to go through our lives and how our lives ought to be lived if we're going to call ourselves Christian. And so I hope that today, after this Easter Sunday, that you will remember what great things the Lord has done for us. And we will also remember what small things we can do for other people just so that they might know that being a Christian is not about getting all we can for ourselves. But getting a, uh, being a Christian is about following a poor man who could have been, could have had everything, 
a poor man who became poor, gave up all that he had for us, died and was resurrected. Resurrection affects our ethics and how we treat other people. Let's pray. Our Father, today we are incredibly thankful for the resurrection and what it means to us. I pray that you will bless us now, that you will cause us to care about how we treat other people, that you will cause us to care about how we use the money that you have given us. And I pray that you will bless each of us who listens to this, that our lives will be affected by the resurrection. And I pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.